Everybody hear me okay? Yeah, all right. Thank you for such an introduction. No, yeah, how am I going to live up to that after that? I'm glad to be here and thank John too for his introduction as well. Thank you for coming. As you say, a lot of friends in this audience. We've made them through the years we've been here. Jane and I look forward to this show every year to come back because it's so much fun to see old friends get to show our art and get the shot in the arm by the other artists who are so good at this show. I go home, I get up every year to do better art when I come back. But this is indeed an honor for me, and I'm glad to be here tonight. A friend of mine who's here tonight, a successful author, talking to him, he said, I want to give you a little advice, David. He said, the secret to a good speech presentation is a good introduction, a good ending, and a short in-between. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to cut this to two hours tonight. <laughs> 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 The title of my talk tonight is Marching to a Different Drum. I consider myself a historical artist, as there are a lot of us in this particular room here, artists that we figured we paint historical settings. And the reason why we march to a different drum, I'm going to try to cover a little bit of that so you have a better understanding of us artists in this room that paint history paintings. I'm going to try to read this and then real quick, I'm going to give you a little background about my life and then we'll get into it about historical pain. I was born during the war, a long time ago, you guys remember the war, in Rosing, Kentucky, which is a little rural town, primarily a farming and coal, coal mining. Today, though, that town is known as the bluegrass, the birthplace of bluegrass music. And so why am I glad to be here? Well, I've been blessed all my life by a lot of different things, but I've also had a few challenges, too, I've dealt with. I've never shared this publicly with anybody, so don't get squirming too much. Before I was the age of five, I had tuberculosis, I had polio, and I was hit by a car. <laughs> polio and the TB were like cases, and I recovered from that. I've had a good life ever since. Hit by a car situation, it was a little different. A highlight of that, if I may say this, was my brother who witnessed it. I darted out in the road and got hit. Okay, that's right. A brother who witnessed that said, I look like Superman flying through the air. <laughs> I don't remember any of that. <laughs> if I can take that, come back from that, come here. I spent a year in the war. So believe me, I'm blessed. Family here, here tonight. My lovely wife, Jane, my children, Shannon and Sean. Handsome grandson here, Jeremiah, and Shannon's son, John. So I've been blessed. And this is a whole room full of friends that we have made through these years. I've been coming to this show. Artists <clears throat> known before and artists who are here, I've really been blessed. But thanks a lot for coming tonight, and this is truly an honor for me. Now that we got all of that out of the way, I'll get into the marching for a different marching to a different drum and why we historical artists may be a little different than other artists can. First of all, I'm a realist. Realism was called naturalism at one time, but the term realism goes back how far? How far do you think realism goes back? I probably ought to at this point. Can you that? Well, that's a picture of me. I'm a little skinny kid on the right side there. That's in my hometown when I was with But here we go. Realism goes back 48,000 years. That's an image in a cave in Altamira, Spain. Altamira, Spain. This is an image in Bacal. France, 20,000, 28,000 years later. Now look at their realism and you see in those, they definitely qualify as realism. That's 800 miles apart, 20,000 years difference. Believe that or not. So it goes back a long, long way before we quote, started to paint realism. So let's fast forward 20,000 years and we get into the 16th, 15th, 16th century. Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo too who are doing historical paintings, religious paintings, of a thousand years, possibly before, 1,600,000 years of the earlier time period. Now, they were primarily sponsored by the church and wealthy patrons, too. But if we fast forward on to, there we go, that thing. 18th century America, this is an American artist, Benjamin West, who's doing historical paintings in 1775 of the French and Indian War, which took place 
in the 1750s. So he's painting 10, 20, 30 years earlier, possibly. This painting is the, the Death of Wolf, and we're going to come back to this a little later. This is a historic painting, the Death of Wolf, that took place during the Battle of Quebec in the French and Indian War. By the mid 19th century, 1850s, historical subjects of the genre of settling this country were very bold. Religious paintings had pretty well gone out of vogue by then. And this painting by William Rainey, Daniel Boone, overlooking Kentucky, I don't know exactly what the title of it is, looking into the bluegrass. Mel, is that right? Daniel Boone looking into the bluegrass. And at the same time, another artist, George K. O. Begum did this painting of Daniel Boone escorting the settlers into Kentucky. Now we're going to come back to this one because this painting plays an important part in my life. But as you see, by the mid 19th century now, we're doing historical paintings of 100 years before, and there was a whole lot of artists that did historical paintings of that time period. So, this painting, as I said, has a significant impact on my life a couple years later, but let's don't overlook our favorite of all, Remington and Russell. They were painting cowboys, of course, but they moved all the way back to Lewis Park, and Indians and such up to a hundred and something years before them as well. So from that standpoint, American historical work has a good solid basis for it. Our historical artists, we have our pitfalls because from the marching to a different drum, the thing that makes us different from other artists is that we take a time, a place, and we try to recreate a story that's around that at an earlier time period. But you have your pitfalls. You can make mistakes, and they'll show up. And once you make a mistake, it's set in stone, and it'll be with you for all. And believe me, I've made my mistakes during this time period. So I'm going to show you one right now. I'm going to be light on this. Everybody knows this painting. George Washington crossing the Delaware during the attack on Trenton, right? 1775. It was painted in the mid 1800s by Manuel Lutz, who was a German artist. That crossing took place in the middle of the night. <laughs> we artists take artist license. We have to make our paintings better. You know? now, this painting plus the flag that he showed in there wasn't invented or wasn't developed until a few years later. So that makes that painting historically inaccurate. But does that make it less of an important painting to y'all? Painting's got to be a good painting, or it doesn't rate doesn't sell, it doesn't mean anything to you. So what do you got? You got the trade between a stark artist who has to do a good painting, at the same time, if he's gonna be starkly accurate, he's got to do his homework. He's got to be able to know what goes into that painting and put it in there and hopefully five years later something won't surface that changes the whole historical background. And believe me, I've had that done. What's set in stone today and tomorrow Something new may come up that changes that whole dialogue of work. So, when this painting here came up, we all recognize it. It's a great painting. It's a piece of Americana. It's an icon of American work. That painting is incorrect, almost as bad as Manuel Lutz's painting. The reason why that painting has bearing on my life is that that's the Cumberland Gap. In 2001, I was hired by do a commission to do a painting for the Cumberland Gap National Park to replace the George K. Bayham painting because it was historically inaccurate. The reason why, you go back to that painting, look at the landscape around it there, the craggy cliffs and everything that's there. Look at that. <laughs> now, that's the road that went up over the Cumberland Gap and was built there. That's the wilderness trail that became the highway over the Cumberland Gap later on. Look at this one. That photograph was made during the Civil War when they cut all the trees off of it to feed the furnaces that were down there out of sight. And you can see from that saddle, that saddle is right there in the middle where Bingham's painting takes place with Daniel Boone coming across there, that there's no craggy peaks in the woods. Bingham was a Missouri artist. They apparently never came to the Cumberland Gap. <laughs> and the sun is in the wrong place, too. So we take 100, that was painted in 1852. So we're going from 1852 to 2002, 
And the National Park Service finally said, we've got to have a painting that's historically, we hope, correct. And thank goodness, I was hired to do it. <laughs> and I did. Now, here's the reason why. Well, if I can get. Okay. When I took this commission, of course, I went over to the Cumberland Gap. I went through everything with the people that worked there. I was a sign historian to go with me. We walked the wilderness road up, and at that time they were rebuilding. They cut that road completely out and filled all of that land back to its natural contour and planted a tree while I was during that year I was doing the painting. And the wilderness road was being built up right below it where it originally was. So I was on that and walking that up to the saddle, and I'm standing there in the saddle, and I turned around and looked behind me into Tennessee. Now the trees here are a lot smaller, obviously, than they would have been in 1775. But I looked up there and I saw that blue mountain of Tennessee way out there. Now, this is my painting that I did. Hopefully it's historically correct. Hopefully nobody's going to find something tomorrow that will change that. But based on my research during all that time and my research through the years, especially Dan going in front of our frontier history, that's been one of my favorite subjects. I hope this painting stands as a more correct painting. And you can see, I think, I can't see from here, you may be able to see those Tennessee hills back through there, you might see that opening there, which shows them where they came from. They came out down into Tennessee, come up over the Cumberland Gap, went into Kentucky. The Wilderness Road supplied all of those people that settled in Kentucky and beyond for numbers of years. I think 300,000 people went through the Cumberland Gap before the turn of the century. So, standpoint of doing that painting. It was great for me to do that painting. I'm really glad I got the job. Hope I did a good job on it. It's been on my, and it's in the show here tonight. The other things that separate us from some other arts it's done, is that we have to use models. We have to do research, first of all. Models, props, which all feed into what we do. Remember, we're recreating a time period that's not in front of us. We don't see it. We have to imagine it. We have to bring it to creation of the people looking at it and saying that's really real. That may have happened. That's what it looked like. At the same time, it has to be a good painting. Just don't ever overlook the fact that it's got to be a good painting. It can be as dark as correct, it can be a bad painting, and it won't sell or it won't bring the attention to it. It can be a good painting and start to correct, and you've done just a disservice to people and the other way around. Because people look at your work and think that's the right thing. There's a painting in Nashville, The Battle of New Orleans, done by a well-known artist in Nashville. I swear to goodness, Andrew Jackson's got an 1873 cold peacemaker in his hand. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what the impact of that, if you look at that, from that great painting of the Battle of New Orleans until you come around and focus on one thing there, and that's what's so out of place. What else in there is wrong that we don't know? And how many people walk away from that thinking, that's really what's happened? Well, that's our job, is to research and put that on the table as best that we know in our phone. We use props, and props that are very important to us. And I go back to this painting by Benjamin West of The Death of Wolf. And you see right here, in fact, man, you can do that. See that pouch right there? Benjamin Wolf collected Indian artifacts for his paintings. And they're still in existence today. And I used some of Benjamin West's artifacts in my painting. And there's that pouch that's in the collection of Benjamin Wolf. And there's a knife and a sheath that he has painted in his paintings too. Well, I did a painting, there it is again, called Warrior, and I used that pouch and that knife sheath in my painting because it's historically accurate and it's real. It was there during the time that he collected that, 1770s that he was painting it. Those artifacts go all the way back to that time period, and I used them in there, but also we have non existent let's see if I went too far, do it? I think it does. This thing is really touching, please. <laughs> anyway, using props and models are important to us if we're going to get the story straight. These are some of my models, but also these men know their history. They recreate history in the fur trade area. One of these guys modeled for equal health. And his clothing and everything, when I go into an artist, I look at Hawk and I say, I know your stuff's going to be right. I don't have to worry about what he shows up with. It may be wrong. Long time period or whatever. 
They bring the horses, they bring everything on it. I've got the confidence that I can paint these fellows knowing that what they do are correct. And this is really a big benefit to artists, is that one time I was asked, do you use photographs in your paintings? I said, yeah. But I remember a quote from one of my favorite historical artists, John Clymer, when he was interviewed. He was asked the same question. He said, do you use photographs? He said, yes, I need all the help I can get. <laughs> How true that is. Because the thing, photography is 100 and, what, 180 years old? Well, no. The camera obscura was invented in the 14th century. And that's the early forerunner of the photographic machine. And artists were using the camera obscura where they pinpointed through a hole and projected something on a wall and were drawing it. That was pretty well proven. But that's been around a long, long time. We know Russell and Remington both use photographs. And what's wrong with that? If you take the photograph for what it is and know the shortcomings of it and take the corrections from it, we don't want to copy the photograph as it might be because you got distortions and things like that. So with that in mind, I use photographs all the time. I set up my model. I need that help. And then when you get back to props, one paint, group of paintings or a subject I really love to paint are birch bark canoes, Indians, mountain men, frontiersmen in birch bark canoes, and I've done a bunch of them. So I had one built for me in 1995, and that's me in 1995 when I was young and bulletproof. <laughs> well, that canoe served me well for a lot of years. years my canoe is a prop, and there's one of my good, good Indian men who's my model for that painting. Uh, and here's the painting that came out of it. So I take these as basics, you know, to work from, and hopefully my work is better because of it. Well, uh, fast forward to the day the canoe died. <laughs> One of my friends out here was with me when we were canoeing the Green River, Kentucky, August a year ago, and we hit a bad snag and broke that canoe in half, and we lost it there, and we bumped off, didn't we? left that canoe on that sandbar because we still had two days to go on this trip and there wasn't a way to save that canoe. So gave our adieu to it, walked away. He put us in his canoes and we finished up the trip. But you know what? I think if a canoe had a soul, I think you'd rather die out there on that sandbar <laughs> hanging in the rafters of some antique shop or restaurant. I had it for 23 years. Now this painting here, this is another prop, landscapes, that's a prop. When we do a historical painting, we do a landscape, we better be pretty sure that the landscape is what it was at the time we're depicting. Today it's not necessarily in all cases. In this particular case, and, and you recognize this painting, that, birth, that uh, sycamore tree right there, five miles from our house, and I'd go over to it and photograph it. I've camped in that thing and built fires in it. Not the one you see in the painting, because I had to make it smaller in the painting than it really is in life. Because when I drew it to full size in life, wow. it overwhelmed the painting. You know, so I had to go back. Because that tree was full grown 200 years ago when long hunters tried this country. And it was hollow, and there's stories about it. It witnessed a battle across the road during the Civil War, so it's got all kinds of history. Today that tree's gone. About five, six years after the painting, it died. Been there for 400 years, and it died on my watch. Which is, you know, but anyway, we go back. And some canoe paintings I've done, you saw the early ones. That's it, that's it, that's it, out of Now, other models, people, are a lot of fun, and I hope I'm more enjoyable to work with and some other things I'll get into here in a moment. Modeled for me, she was Cherokee, she modeled for me for a number of paintings, and we see. Okay, uh, Well, that's a good one to die on, you know. <laughs> <laughs> There we go. Here she, she was Cherokee, and that guy was Cherokee. But she's, here she's a, a Southern uh, plane. And uh, there she is, another Indian 
to good moral and religious order. But now, on the other hand, well, here's another good model for me. This is Wes Cooney. And I worked on Last of the Mohicans. I met Wes, which has turned out to be a great blessing in my life, too. Neat guy. And he was on set, and he was modeling. He was deaf and I'll tell you what. He didn't talk to him. He didn't look him in the eye. He was a guy. But off set, the minute we broke, he's a neat guy. Enjoyed his company. Been their house. Kate and I enjoyed his company. He and his family. And he modeled for me while we were on that. Took time out for me to photograph him, and I've done a number of paintings with him. And he had a great movie. Oh. You remember his model, that's him. Funny thing of that is I've never painted him as Cherokee. He's Cherokee. And I never painted him as Cherokee. I painted him a Mingo, I painted him as a Huron, I painted him as a Shawnee. I painted everything but Huron. I mean, he's a Cherokee. Yeah, a couple of weeks ago, I was talking to him. He said, you know, I need to do one of you for Cherokee before you get too old. <laughs> <laughs> that's what, 25 years ago? That was, uh, <laughs> he said, that'd be nice. You know, and so I might do that. But anyway, this painting here, working with different models. This is one of my models who I've painted a number of times, my Cobra. But this painting, tight spot, it's in the exhibit up here tonight. It was supposed to have a dog in it. When I laid this out, drew it, initiated the thought process behind it, I was going to have a dog pull right up next to him, you know, and this, this is a tense painting, obviously, right? The question is, are those guys going to find out he's here or there or not? Well, Mike was good. He knew exactly what I want, but then when I got to the dog, you <laughs> haven't seen the rest of it yet. This is just the first photograph. Good mountain cur, time period correct, the dog was there at the time period. But he was on something, I guarantee. <laughs> <laughs> he wouldn't settle down and he wouldn't sit there beside Mark while I photographed him. So I fired him and I went to That's very goodness, I think that dog had talked to the earlier dog. <laughs> What a gig, boy, oh boy, boy, we got this made here. Just know if you sit here long enough to feed you. But then, <laughs> that dog would say, What do you want me to do today? Anything's fine. You know? So, we went to one of somebody, the lady's hand in there, put that hat on the dog. It was such a cute photograph, but I haven't painted that dog yet. And I don't think I could get away with putting that dog in that hat. Now, that pretty well wraps up about props and research and <coughs> models said to me, when I come to this show every year, this is a shock and arm to me. Go in there and look at the work on those walls. They're great. I go away, lift it up, say, I need to do better stuff next year when I come back. And I try. And we come back every year. We've been doing this now for what, 14, 15, 14 years, haven't we? Yeah. And it's like old home week to come here and see all of y'all friends that we have made through these years to be in this room, to be in that show. The Idol Door people have been great to us, all of us. I think every artist in here agree with that. Really a fine show. Good group of people. I say thanks to all of them. Are you back on board here? Okay, good. Yeah. Some of the different artists, I didn't take all of them in there. Do you recognize these, these artists and their paintings? And there's my statement that I've made for a long, long time in my belief of being a historical artist and where we stand. So with that statement there is a, is a finale of trying to do what we can. Like I said, if it's not a good painting, it's not going to go anywhere. It may be so historically correct that you just get a pipe and look at it and say, that's it. But if it's not a good painting, if we hadn't done our job, composition, color, all those things that we learn as artists, if we don't apply those, being historically correct is not going to make it go anywhere at all. That gives you kind of a little bit of an idea behind what we historical artists go through that might make us march to a different drum. Right? Yeah. That's my favorite part.